Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Jason Weil. Today is October 11th, 2023, and this is the Jupiter Lab weekly meeting. Uh, we have uh, how many people? Nine participants at this hour. Um, please sign in on the HackMD. Um, we have a few people on the agenda. Um, I just, before we get started with the rest of the agenda, I just wanted to make a quick announcement on the record. Meetings uh, like this one have an on the record and off the record portion. The on record portion gets published to our official YouTube channel. Um, our community guidelines prohibit recording meetings on your own, including using AI bots for summarization or transcription. So please don't use those. Please rely on our official recordings. Thanks. Um, Frederick has a couple of topics to get us started. And is he on the call at the moment? I'm not sure that he is. Well, if he's not on, I can quickly read that out just for the record here. Um, so Frederick notes, um, for council members only, there is a pull request to ping the council members twice a year. Um, please comment on Jupiter Lab Council Issues 9. I can drop that into the chat. Um, if there's no feedback before the weekend, I'll start rolling it. Um, and Nicolas Brichet is requested to have write rights on Jupiter Lab so he can rerun the CI pipeline. Um, and then a question about interest in the Jupiter Community Survey 2023. I am not so familiar with the community survey. Is anyone else? So there was a mail sent to the council, uh, which uh, includes a spreadsheet for um, signups. This will be half an hour session with the community building committee where um, members of subprojects will be able to provide feedback on how uh, the community um, building should proceed. And maybe Andre has some more uh, insight on that. Yeah, anything to add on that, Andre? Okay, sorry for putting you in this box. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Andrew is unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything uh, from you. Uh, one second, please. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, some technical difficulties. Mike, could you please repeat uh, if I have, what was the question about? If I have more details about what? Yeah, uh, I was wondering whether whether you might have some, some more thoughts on the uh, building committee, but um, maybe I... Uh, I I was mistaken. Sorry. Uh, well, on which I, I see that there is uh, Frederick. Yeah, Frederick just joined. Um, we were going through the bullet points that you had put on the agenda, um, specifically about the community survey 2023. Is there anything you wanted to add about that? Oh, I haven't. Uh, it's not me who put it on the agenda. So unfortunately, I don't have anything to add. Okay, yeah, I was addressing Frederick specifically because he just joined the meeting. Thanks, thanks for joining, Frederick. You're welcome. Uh, yes, so uh, it was about the the email I forwarded to the to the council. Uh, so the community uh, subgroup is looking for people for doing interview. Um, I guess it's for uh, scooping which kind of action they should prioritize and stuff like that. And yeah. The question is not how, sorry, it's who, same letters, wrong order, <laughs> who is interested in, in doing uh, the interview. Um, so, yeah. If I recall correctly, it's about like half an hour. That's the, the length of the interview they want to do. I probably would be remiss if I um didn't contribute to that because I talk so much about it. Um, so I'm happy to contribute. I just wish this stuff was less clandestine. Um, it's really weird. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna we're gonna miss members of the community in this, but I'm happy to help. Thanks, Tony. And I I guess you can. As, uh, my fear was that too many of us will uh, propose themselves because they want to restrict to three seats per uh, 
sub project. Um, so as there has been much uh, people answering, uh, feel free to uh, to come like to fulfill the form. If I want, uh, if you want, I can send you the email. If you don't have received, yeah, it. that that would be helpful. And I mean, I don't know. I could probably even represent, say, the accessibility sub project too. Makes sense. Okay. Well, if there's no other comments on those issues, um, Frederick, I don't know if you wanted to revisit any of the earlier um, ones. There, there was a bullet point about um, granting uh, Nicolas Brichet um, right rights, which is surprisingly hard to say, on Jupiter Lab, um, so we can rerun the CI. There was also a discussion in the chat about should we have a bot that can rerun failed CI jobs? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think it's low risk to grant Mr. Boucher um, the rights for the purposes of the CI. Any objections to that? Thanks, Jason. Okay, no problem. I can I can um, take a look at that. Uh, Mike has a few bullet points coming up on the agenda. So if there's no nothing else to discuss on the first section, let's move on to Mike. All right. Um, so I've opened an issue um, to track enabling for windowed mode for notebooks. This is something that we touched upon in one of the previous meetings. Uh, briefly, that was planned for for. 4.0 release, but we reverted to the defer mode and the windowed notebooks are not enabled by default, but because this would provide um, quite an enhancement when it comes to performance and responsiveness of the app, it would be good if we could have that back. Um, and I've tried to list all of the issues which were reported uh, as related to uh, scrolling or windowed notebook directly. Um, my question for today was whether anyone else is looking at these issues or working on them. Um, and if not, maybe we could help um, addressing some of them. If not, um, we can move to the next point, but please do not hesitate to leave a comment on the issue number 15258. Uh, so the next point is a pull request uh, which exposes the execution history in the notebook UI. Um, and the idea is that you can use alt arrow up, alt arrow down to go through the previously executed cells or commands in um, in your uh, history of executions. So that doesn't, um, is, is not separated by notebooks. Uh, thank you for the comment that this is going to be also a feature um, in the chat. Um, so it, it, it's modeled on on the console, it's already available in Jupyter Lab. If you, instead of using Notebook, open the console, it's not currently available in Notebooks. Um, the pull request makes it opt in. My first question is whether these shortcuts, which are proposed, uh, make sense to everybody, or if there are um, any opinions on that, please leave a comment on the pull request. Um, the second point is that. Um, because the sessions are shared, it might be um, sometimes weird for users to see uh, cells that they executed in another environment or separately in a Python console. And maybe because of that, we could or should work with the kernels um, to advise them not to uh, store history in a one big file, but split it up 
mm, there is an open issue which discusses that and there are workarounds for users to already do that um, but this involves basically creating the file a config file and it's not accessible from the user interface and Jupyter doesn't really have a message configuration message which would um, define that uh, so that's something that uh, or feedback could be appreciated and another related point is that uh, the history request, which is documented in Jupyter client and part of the Jupyter message protocol, is actually not um, polished and was designated as subject to change and potential removal of certain properties, but these were never fully specified. Um, so I'm just highlighting that. Uh, uh, enhancement proposal might follow to clarify the situation but so far no one has commented on this so we uh, don't really have the historical context to understand what changes were planned and we might just end up removing this notice altogether um, yeah. if you have um, comments on the uh, history pull request I would appreciate if you could add them, um, ideally today, but maybe by the end of tomorrow, uh, because I would like to merge that pull request as it seems to be um, in pretty good state, assuming that the tests on CI will pass by then. Any thoughts or comments on this one? Okay, um, so moving on, um, the next point is about JupyterLab 4.1 release. And uh, it seems that it would be good to set a date, uh, even if it's a bit far in the future, but just so that we don't end up with a huge release um, with too many features, uh, which will end up being delayed and delayed. Uh, so my idea would be maybe we could propose um, to have a feature freeze at 8th of November, four weeks from now, and we would still continue reviewing the pull requests, um, which were opened before that date, but no new proposals of any features would be accepted at this point, and um, we could then make a first release candidate, hopefully early in December, and release by the end of this year. Are there any counter proposals? Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, it would it would mean that's uh, almost half a year after the the four O. So yeah, I guess it's a good time. <laughs> yeah, I guess we could shorten this time, maybe three weeks from now any preference but uh, I, I don't feel like giving just two weeks of notices I, uh, so speaking from a position of us bias i think earlier would be better because between the 8th of november and the 6th of december are major holidays in the us um which means that people may be unavailable to do things like testing and schools go on vacation so i think starting sooner would allow more people the chance to test a beta Okay, so let's let's say say first of November feature freeze three weeks from now, then release candidates aiming by by the first of December. I think that sounds good. Thank you. All right, I will add that to the release plan issue. Thank you. Okay, um, that's all from me. Yielding to entry. All right, go ahead, Andrew. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. So uh, I have two announcements. So uh, first one, uh, I'm, I would like to hear your opinions, like get some feedback here during the call. Uh, so 
earlier, we talked about a new text-based communication channel. Uh, and there is a Zulip already created, and it's also owned by Project Jupyter now. So <laughs> thanks for helping me with that very much. Uh, and uh, the uh, I was talking to the media group, and uh, the idea that I wanted to discuss with you all is what do you think about uh, testing Z Zulip as a new uh, or like alternative text-based communication channel for this sub project uh, to see how user experience and actual usage would compare to Gitter. So essentially having for this sub project, for Jupyter Lab sub project, have the, for, for some time have both Gitter and Zulip uh, as like recommended communication channels. Meaning, for example, uh, we would link both communication channels uh, like when you create a issue, right? I will look in other places. If you have any ideas which other places this should be amended, please also let me know. Uh, but this, this would allow us to get real data on how many people would use Zulip versus Gitter. And uh, maybe we can also talk about larger amount of people about user experience. Because our current feedback is uh, uh, kind of, you know, it's based on a pretty low amount of people, like us, 20 people discussing between each other. So that's the reason. Any feedback, any opinions on that? Uh, so I was taking a look in um, the GitHub repository, um, and I can uh, drop in a link here um, because Mike did a good job of summarizing some of his complaints um, about like the current state of the Gitter client, which was in the last couple of years like significantly overhauled and not entirely for the better. Um, personally. I, I have three different chat communication applications running on my work laptop, which is not great. Um, I, I understand that Slack is not likely to be practical because it's, it's paid plans are very expensive. Um, and, and Discord has not been popular because it's a closed source pro product. It does have a paid business model, but um, there is concern about um, like the the free experience, particularly potentially becoming degraded if the company d desires to make more money. So I'd I'd, enc I'd encourage people who are curious about this to download the Zulip client or use it in the web. Like most modern applications, it's mostly a web view. Um, it's different, but take a look and see how you like it. Uh, thank you very much, Chris Lynch. I added them uh, to the notes uh, as a reference. There is a, there might be a third option. Um, I found a, found out today that uh, actually on Discourse, you also have a, a chat. Um, and since we already have a Discourse and a pretty active community there, I don't know how much work it would be to set up a test channel there so that we could use it for uh you know lab day-to-day -day development uh just a couple of users and see see if the ux is good or or at least on par with the other offerings just to at least uh, consider that one and uh, if it's not good then we just we know we can you know read it out i don't know if any of you has tried that one i personally have um, okay well um i have some thoughts but frederick got his hand up no, it, it was just to be sure, uh, the, the goal is just for testing, meaning we won't advertise it for now. It's just for us to test and what are the limitations and how do we feel about it? Uh, yes, exactly. To, uh, so we, we, we gathered, so to speak, qualitative feedback from our core contributors. So from you, from us, <laughs> from myself, from you. And um, uh, the idea is to verify th this with like more people, with uh, more Jupyter contributors and just participants. And if we move to Zilip, then that means also whole project of Jupyter will move to that platform, I guess? 
this is a plan. Uh, so the move, yeah, the move should be uh, the project based, not sub project based. So yes, yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, I personally feel like having um, having discourse is still very valuable, particularly because discourse is publicly readable on the web. So people can find it if they Google stuff. It's it's kind of like uh, most people I know who use Stack Overflow don't go to stackoverflow.com. They just go to their favorite search engine, search for stuff, and they have great search engine placement. Um, so I think having a forum that is web visible would be uh, advisable. And I don't think that either Gitter or Zulip are search engine visible. And even if they were, the fact that the messages are so short are not make them, I think, less valuable as search content. So I think there's still value in having like a forum, um, totally. even though there are some things, even Discord has like a forum functionality, but I like having a web web visible forum. So there is no discussion about removing uh, Discord as a recommended forum. Uh, there okay. is discussion about uh, like replacing uh, Gitter with uh, some other alternative. And Got it. The discussion it uh, turns out to be Zulip as the most popular uh, option with some other like text based option. But we also want to ver verify that uh, it's not this opinion is uh, valid not only for our group but for larger community also. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone has any more comments about uh, text-based communication channels? If not, I have something else to announce. Uh, no? Okay, so the next thing I wanted to announce is uh, we talked about uh, like Twitter posts. How could we promote something on Twitter? And uh, it was not clear how, at least from what I gathered. Uh, and I wanted to clarify that currently people, whoever, uh, can send a request to that email uh, to request uh, some kind of media publication, be it a blog post or X post or Twitter post or whatever else. Uh, yeah, please use this email to request posts. Yeah. And... Uh, as soon as uh, Media Group Charter would be approved, uh, we would also publish a Google form, which would provide a better experience, hopefully. What is the uh, status of the... Oh, sorry, Mike, please repeat. I wanted to ask what is the status of the Mastodon account? Because I, I saw that there was one created and deactivated and then another one created, and I didn't quite follow but there is an account that I can follow or which could publish things or that it's not mm -hmm. yet um, Let me see. Uh, any... There is an official one now, Mike. Um, I'm on the Jupyter Lab list, so there's now one on Hatchyderm. We previously used a different instance, but um, Hatchyderm proved um, more popular. And so it's hatchyderm.io slash at Project Jupiter. And you can tell that it's the official one because there's a special bit of HTML markup on jupiter.org that links back to it. So you get a little verification check mark. Okay, that's that's amazing. But um, it is not posted could, yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could, uh, could we try to migrate the old account into this one? Because I know that this was discussed as one of the Mastodon important features, which enabled you to move between instances so that all the followers who briefly subscribed to the other one would not be confused and would get transferred to this one. I can for sure. I'm already like uh, uh, writing this as a meeting, uh, as an action point for media strategy work group. And, but could you clarify, migrate like uh, the... My well, it, so the the Jupiter account that I created has two hundred thirty five followers, whereas the Hatchy Durham account has four followers, and there is there is a um, there isn't a process. Uh, I don't know how feasible it's going to be now that you've actually set up the new account to like export followers and also basically 
tombstone the old account, make it so that when you go to the old account, it it redirects you to the new Hatchiderm account. And uh, uh, could you advise me like the award uh, with which I can indicate the old Mastodon account? Was it like Fostodon? What was the name of the instance, for example? I can follow up with you separately, Andrew, because I probably have the credentials for this old account um, somewhere or that may be in... in um... I see it in the chat also. So. Yeah, I, I have the credentials personally. Um, okay. That is to say on my work account. Um, so I can follow up with you separately to get you, yeah, and there's, there's documentation that Mike just shared about moving an account from one instance to another. It, it doesn't look like that's what was done here. I think what was done here was just you, you established a new account without getting rid of the old account. Uh, yeah, not like not me personally, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So I, I will say based on people I've seen who have, who have moved from one instance to another, um, especially in the last year, it hasn't worked as smoothly as advertised. Sometimes like data gets like lost in the shuffle. Um, I think it would be more productive to, to grow followers by like making a blog post about this new strategy because our blog is well read and we could also promote the blog on other social media, including X. Um, X has taken a stance against promotion, out, outward promotion of Mastodon accounts in the past, but promoting a blog post, um, it would probably slip through the radar. So, so maybe, maybe the, the old account could just post one and single uh, message whatever it is called. Um, Post, as it's now called. Yeah. Redirecting, so linking to the official, current official one. And maybe if the migration process, as you say, is not always smooth, maybe that would be good enough. Yeah. I can try logging in and see if I can uh, figure this out. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. I'll discuss this all with the media work group. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll reach out to ask you to transfer ownership, Jason. Uh, thank you. This is helps. Uh, yep, that, that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Um... So we don't have any other topics on the agenda. We do have one topic for additional discussion. Um, anyone else want to toss in an agenda topic for a brief discussion before we move on to the tab trap PR? OK, Frederick, the floor is yours again. I put the point, but I'm not the, the most documented people. <laughs> but the three people that have the most uh, knowledge about it are here. Uh, so uh, Gabriel has uh, done the great job of uh, trying to solve the issue of the tab trap in the in the notebook document. Um, and uh, basically, the idea is how can we uh, What's missing in that PR, or what are the stuff we that are left, or what are the the questions that need to uh, to be addressed? Because there is different options, and uh, so we should define like what seems the best option to move forward with that. And yeah, that's that's mainly the question. And knowing that now that we get some timeline for 4.0, it would be good to have it rather early than late the pre-release of 4.0 so that we can test it as much as possible and figure out what's the behavior with that PR in. With that, uh, I leave the floor to Gabriel, Nicola, and Mike. That we just lost uh, Gabriel, but uh, just to for a quick summary, the, uh, we there are some trouble with uh, the 
tap tap sell tap tap in sell uh, with the the way the keyboard events are captured uh, and we try to change it uh, from capture to bubbling meaning that the the widget that have the so the element that have the focus uh, will catch uh, any keyboard event uh, before uh, anything else uh, and and before that it was the opposite uh, meaning that uh, the um, the body of the page was capturing the the, the event and it was uh, <laughs> going down until the the element itself um so when changing it uh there are some logic uh, to change in the in the way the um, uh hold on. The selector are used, and uh, there are some trouble with uh, selector when we select the notebook itself, or a cell in the notebook, or several cell in the notebook. So this is uh, the discussion we should have now, and maybe Mike, you can elaborate it. I think. Yeah, sure. Um, so the way that we now target things is we are targeting depending on the uh, notebook mode so whether it's edit or command mode in the command mode there are some commands which can be executed on a single cell or multiple cells and the current selector in the proposal is the class of the notebook the indicator of command mode space colon focus which means that we are targeting any element which is which has a focus and is child of the notebook within with the command mode enabled. Um, the problem is that when multiple cells are selected, um, currently, as I understand, uh, the active cell does not get focus, and instead the focus is moved back into the notebook mode itself, uh, which means that the commands do not work when multi-selection is active. And there were a few proposals at addressing that either by adding a separate selector, which would still allow to uh, the commands to be enabled when the notebook mode itself is in focus, or by making sure that there is always a child node with the focus even if it's a dummy node, so it's not actually serving um, a, a very specific function, uh, so that the selector that I mentioned earlier, which is now getting all children with focus, does work. Um, and in one of the comments, I posted a number of uh, very quick mockups, which include, um, for example, adding a dedicated multi-selection indicator that could potentially open a new menu. And this new menu would have commands which are specific to multi-selection. So in multi-selection mode, you can still delete cells or cut cells, but maybe other commands which are specific to a single cell do not make much sense. For example, splitting a single cell makes sense in, when one cell is selected, but doesn't make sense when you have multiple cells selected. Merging multiple cells makes sense, but merging a single cell is a no op. Um, the other proposal of using a dummy element would be having an overlay element, which would um, get focus and would basically indicate that these cells could be moved when selected. Um, or it could be just invisible and will just serve as a focus grabber. Another solution um, that was mentioned would be that the, any of the intermediate nodes could receive focus. And what follows is um, a discussion of what the accessibility focused examples suggest. Um, and this derives from example on multi-select list box, which I think does not exactly correspond to 
notebook cells um, because it was not developed with notebook in in, um, in mind, of course, because uh, well, the accessibility guidance groups do not design their specification with Jupyter in mind. But maybe that has some uh, suggestions as to which approach we should um, we should uh, take adopt for this specific use case. Okay, Capital, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, my connection cut out. Like as soon as we transition to this subject, like, <laughs> but um, but I'm back and. Uh, so also I thought I had left a comment on that PR, but I, I I don't I don't see it now. So I think somehow that also got lost um to the internet. But the the thing I don't understand is actually a question that Tony had posted. Like I actually don't really understand what the issue is from a user perspective. Because I I updated the PR, I merged the main into it, I opened it in dev mode and I'm able to select multiple sales, move them, delete them, undo. I'm I'm not really quite sure where the issue lies for the from from the end user perspective. Are are you um uh, on the Nicolas branch which has the bubbling enabled or are you yep. on your own? I also branch? enabled bubbling on it as well. Okay. Yeah. So the issue is when you try to use a keyboard uh keyboard shortcut. So you can do I think everything with the mouse, but not with the keyboard shortcut because uh, the selector is on the, every child of the notebook, which is not an input currently. And uh, when you select several cell, your your focus oh oh yeah uh, your focus is on the um, on the notebook itself. So the the not, the shortcut that's not will what not work. That's not what I observed with my changes because my changes were to kind of keep the focus on the cell and not allow focus to return to the notebook. And that's kind of part of the, one of the design goals or one of the implementation goals of this PR was to uh, get away from ever having focus on the notebook node itself and only on individual cells. Well, individual cells or items Within those, cells. like something within the the DOM the subtree, the DOM subtree of the notebook. Okay, so maybe maybe we should go back to testing that pull request to determine whether a change is needed. But what you are suggesting is that the notebook should never receive the focus itself. Yeah. The the one time that, that I was concerned about that was what happens if you have an empty notebook, but Jupyter Lab doesn't seem to allow to have an empty notebook with no cell. Like every time I've created a notebook, I have a cell added. Well, te technically a cell can be deleted. Um, it will be instantaneously added, but there will be milliseconds where it's not, and I don't know what happens to focus. One um, potential um, situation where during having multi selection, the focus could be lost would be when you focus out of the window and get back, but that requires just further testing. So maybe we are not ready to, to discuss uh, whether changes are needed if we are not sure if it's working, but yeah. That was not something that we knew before <clears throat> we start discussion. So, um, I, I do want to also comment because there was a comment made about the, you know, the fact that the multi-select list box pattern keeps focus on the list box itself. I think there are there are good there are potentially good reasons to do that, and actually it's very similar to what I implemented with um, my PR, because. I think with, with the with the W three C aria pattern example for a multi select list box, I it's not entirely clear to me, but I think the design motivation for not making each item in the list box tab flexible is 
so that you don't add a whole bunch of elements on the page that the user has to tab through in order to like navigate through the different nodes on the page or have focusable notes on the page. And that was kind of what I was thinking also when I made the changes to the notebook is um, allow the user to kind of quickly tab to different sections of UI. And then when once they're within the notebook, they can use keyboard shortcuts like J, K, up, down to, to move between cells within it. So in, in that respect, it does match that sort of multi-select list box pattern. That said, I don't think it's exactly great to keep the focus on the notebook node itself as you know, at, at like the DOM focus and then have some other sort of like internal focus on each cell as the user goes from cell to cell within a notebook. The reason is that if you do go down the route of like using one of these patterns, you have to sort of implement a lot of stuff that the browser just gives you for free. So like when you, when the user, uh, you know, moves down from item to item, you have to make sure that the item that they currently have active like scrolls into view you have there's like a whole bunch of extra like things you have to do that the browser will just give you for free if you just use dom focus um so that and the other thing and there's and there's a few other area a few other ways in which like the that comparison breaks down another thing we don't do right now is we don't have any kind of real focus indicator for the notebook node itself so wh whereas like with that with that pattern example on the W3 site, it actually puts a focus ring around the entire list box itself. So for 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 those reasons and others, I, I kind of like the idea of continuing to use focus on a single cell. Um, I know that it's kind of weird semantically when you have multiple cells selected, like and then you and then you take a keyboard shortcut, but the focus is on a single cell as opposed to like that collection of cells. However, I do think there's precedence for it. Like the, the file browser, for example, and file browser implementations that I've seen in other places, you can select multiple files. And generally, like when a good uh, file browser implementation is in place, when you select multiple files, like all of the commands become multi-file commands. So like if you click on, if you want to like preview a file, well, it will open like a preview for all of the files. Or if you want to like rename a file, it will open up a kind of special uh, dialogue or utility to rename all the files. But it, the truth is in Jupyter right now, we have a lot of commands that can accept multiple files as input, but some of them can only accept one, but we still allow you to sort of like execute those commands when you have multiple files selected. And in that case, the command gets executed on the file that is currently focused or active. <laughs> That's really useful to have this um, these thoughts, and I'm also trying to uh, keep up with the chat. And Tony is uh, pasting a lot of links. Uh, just just wanted to say that for me, at least, um, the um, uh, for free uh, website is down, and it's also down on our CI. Uh, which is timing out for many of this. So I, I don't have access to some of these links right now. Um, and uh, separately, I added a, a question on the PR that potentially this might, a, any kind of implementation might to be tested with full windowed mode, windowing mode for notebook. Because if the focus is on a cell and you start expanding the multi selection up, at some point, the old cell might get deleted from the DOM when we are using the windowing. Uh, so probably then the focus would get lost, which is... That might be the biggest argument for putting the focus on the notebook node itself. That was one thing I did run into with that PR, uh, and I didn't have a solution for it. Is, well, um... the, the, the solution for it would be to augment the uh, windowing mode so that it always fee, uh, keeps the active slash maybe end focused cell in the view 
uh, yeah, which might be... I would be in favor for that too, yeah. because I I think it will help us here for the window mode to the ability to jump uh, when a user has scrolled and then is typing again, and so that we can jump directly to and that the editor is still there, so we capture correctly also what's typing. So I think I think the style at the end should the one that's focused should stay in the the viewport like hidden but not removed from the DOM. Okay, and in the chat, Tony was saying that what we implement is consistent with the grid pattern uh, in accessibility terms, in ARIA terms, in, in the sense that it never gets focus and gives focus to the last focused element. Uh, Tony, do, do you have something else to add here? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh... The, the 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 thing that's difficult with notebooks is we really don't have a reference implementation of what this thing is and i think it turns out that the notebook can actually have multiple like roles that it's represented with um and one of in the interactive state the one that makes the most sense for the notebook is the grid pattern which is like gabriel said earlier is it's a pattern meant to remove tab stops. So it basically turns a composite widget into a single tab stop. And then the requirement is, is that the implementer provide uh, the uh, focus management inside of there, right? So a grid is actually a pattern that you put on a table. So um, it's got grid rows, grid columns, um, and grid cells. So in order to implement the grid pattern properly for assistive technology, um, and I think we can do that in another PR uh, if we uh, if this comes up formally, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, it will take some work to get the grid pattern down, but it is likely the right pattern. And with the grid pattern comes the ability to use ARIA multi-selectable. Um, so that means that on your grid rows, um, which are roles for a for a table grid. Um, you would provide aria uh, selected equals true. And that just gives you, like, basically there's no other situation where multiple cells are selected, right? So with this pattern, it almost gives you uh, the right selector there. Um, so now what that means is that the implementer has the option of um, controlling or bending what is recommended through the specification, right? Because you can even imagine like being able to take a selection and like move a selection up, right? Like maybe you missed a cell and maybe you want to like move it up or something like that. There might be some different ways to navigate. You might even want to manage focus a little bit differently. But ultimately the parent container manages focus and never receives it. Um, it's given to interactive elements that are inside of the object. So I think like all in all, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, right now, this it seems to me the tab trap PR should focus on keyboard users and keyboard navigability. And from that standpoint, sorted, right? Uh, but for assistive tech users, there are still some things to do. Um, for some UX reasons, there are still some things to do. Um, so I think we want to like kind of uh, find a way to move this one forward and start thinking about aligning with some of these things down the line. Cause we're making progress. We've got things in place, right? Like this time it was easy to see that the feed role actually wasn't right in this scenario. There is a scenario where it's right. So now that we want to use ARIA multi-selectable because it actually is the proper way to do this accessibility wise, um, we figure out that we want to choose a role that can be that um, list, list box, has the same uh, management, but the list box is like an option thing that has its own focus. The elements inside of it don't have focus. With the grid, you have to manage your own focus. I'm gonna stop there, but I think that, yeah, that's all. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything uh, Tony just said. Um, but I think I still might have some questions about using you know, uh, the grid role. Though I think I think if I understood Tony correctly, what he's I think he's suggesting is that um, those that kind of question can be 
address later as we sort yeah. of get this PR out. <clears throat> yeah, we would we would have we would improve. So right now, yeah, we'd improve this assistive tech in another TR. Right now, just I I would I would call this PR the tab chat PR. Focus on keyboard navigability and call it a day and open up PRs on other design axes. Okay, so uh, what is the uh, the next step to, to get this moving? I guess, uh, uh, Gabriel, could you possibly merge in uh, the changes that Nicola was working on so that we could test it on the binder of this pull request? Or do you think that those require further review before you merge them into your branch? Um, I'm happy with y'all doing, you know, doing adding, adding, and um, doing whatever you need to do with the PR. I, I think I gave Nicola rights to my fork of Jupyter Lab, so I think he can push directly to the branch. I get a little bit confused sometimes with what happens on GitHub after like other people make commits to the PR and stuff. Yeah, I receive your right. Uh, maybe I can open the PR on you. On your branch, like like that, you can see it and uh, see what you're merging. Yeah, just uh, yeah, just tell me what I need to do, and I'm happy to push any buttons y'all need or anything. Okay, and um, as a next step, I guess we would, because we are happy with the behavior overall. There is this one question of multi selection that needs further testing, but. Because we are happy, I think we, we would enable bubbling uh, on by default without the need of the config file. And then merge this pull request and release an alpha and see uh, how it works in a real life scenarios. So okay. the bubbling, for the bubbling, I think we'll uh, take the path, the initial path of Nicola. Meaning that uh, I think it should still be configurable at the Lumino level and be forced by default in case some people use Lumino in other application to not mess up their their behavior and change it just for our application. Yeah, so default for Jupyter Lab, but not for Lumino. Okay, great. I'm excited oh. to see this going forward. Thank you all. Great discussion. Uh, one more, one point I was curious about, Mike. You mentioned uh, earlier about like losing cells and stuff like that with the virtual rendering. Um, so like the virtual rendering, so you don't have to repaint stuff. Is it still possible to carry forward some like DOM that ha propagates like ARIA information, or did you guys solve that in your little discussion? You guys sorted out a way for this multi-select over a long distance um, of cells? I, I think we'll need to continue discussing that. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and that comes back to the issue that I linked of, of things which we'll, we still need to improve before enabling the windowed, fully windowed mode by default. Yeah, I think one of the things that might be worth considering, right, is like if there are cells that are out of view and nothing is happening to them, there still might be some non-rendered, like non-painted aria that could still show up in the accessibility tree without having to do full repaints, right? So, like with you know, you can go and still have uh, a cell that's aria multi-selected, and you still know this thing is selected, and maybe you push up an aria label or an aria described by, but you still might be able to expose some stuff that doesn't require re-render to yeah. a screen reader potentially uh, absolutely and we don't remove actually the nodes from the from the dom tree what we do is we hide them and the the way we, we are hiding them is currently using display maybe that will change in the future um, but depending on the behavior of assistive tech it's, it's it a bit might yeah it's, it's a it bit might... more complicated than that like the code cells are kept because we need to keep the output, but the markdown are removed from the DOM. They're in memory, but they are removed from the DOM. So like for okay. those, you really want to have the headings pulled out, right? 
you kind of want like some hidden role that's just like heading here's the aria and now that can be now the screen reader would have access to all of the headings yeah i mean we get the information because now the talk is built independently oh right 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 Th that's a necessary feature yeah so you get you do get that um i'll have to check uh interested in talking about this because i'd love to check how it works with assistive tech and like what kicks in the window rendering and stuff like that so i could actually test it uh, i would really appreciate if you could open an issue summarizing like what are the challenges with the full windowing mode so we can um add it to the tracking issue so we, we know what is the state of that cool yep and i'll try and get a, a issue up about the grid roll all right so we are current we are practically at the top of the hour. Thank you all for your uh, excellent discussions here. Um, I would like to take a little time to see if anybody has any additional on record discussions that they wanted to have, or if you want me to stop the recording to have off record discussions. All right, brace yourself. Three, two, one.